We will get started. It's top of the hour. Welcome everyone to the seminar series of the Trans NIH Resilience Working Group established in 2019 and led by the Office of Dietary Supplements as a co coordinating activity to help harmonize language and conceptualize frameworks and resilience that can be applied across the NIH. The theme of this year's seminar series is experimental designs and outcomes that advance the study of resilience in the biomedical sciences. Today, we are pleased to welcome our speaker, Dr. Heather Whitson, Professor of Medicine, Director, Duke Aging Center, and Co-Director of the Duke UNC Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. In these roles, Dr. Whitson is an active contributor and thought leader in the emerging field of physical resilience as she strives to optimize independence and resilience in people with multiple chronic conditions. Today's presentation is entitled, The Science of Bouncing Back from Health Stressors, Duke Pepper Model of Physical Resilience. With that, I will give Dr. Whitson the floor. All right, thank you so much, and thank you for that introduction and the opportunity to speak to this group. I think I wanna start by saying that as noted, I'm a geriatrician and a clinician. Um, in, in medicine, and I am so excited to talk to this audience, partly because I think it involves a lot of disciplines different than mine, and, I, and that for me is always an opportunity to learn um, and to have this construct that I'm gonna tell you about um, that we've developed uh, for a very clinical medicine purpose, um, really informed um, by our colleagues from a lot of different disciplines. So I, I think that the concept of resilience seems to resonate across every discipline that I've ever encountered. And I think that there are so many opportunities to use that concept that resonates um, to sort of uh, inform or, or elaborate um, how it can be used and applied uh, in our own work. So with that, um, I also want to make it really clear that I am speaking today sort of um, about a, a construct that has been elaborated by a lot of people, not just myself. Um, I uh, am at Duke and the theme of our uh, Duke Pepper Center and our Aging Center is resilience um, and age-related changes in resilience. Um, and so what I'll be talking to you about is sort of how we've thought about um, this concept and how we've applied it, um, but, but very much recognizing that other people have applied and used um, even the terminology slightly differently. And I, I like to think of that as, a, as um, not a hindrance, um, but just an opportunity to, um, for discussion. Um, I uh, am uh, much of our work is funded by the uh, NIA. I'm also an employee um, of the Durham uh, VA. And just since in these in this virtual world, um, it's <laughs> I think it's kind of good to just place ourselves um, in the real world. And uh, this is uh, Durham, my home, and that is the Durham Bulls uh, uh, ballpark stadium, which is kind of the center of our town and Duke campus is over there, not too far away from downtown Durham. That's Duke campus, um, which has this beautiful Gothic uh, buildings and you can see our beautiful chapel uh, there in the back. And then in the inset, you see the chapel as well as the entrance from the campus side um, to the Duke School of Medicine. You can walk through these doors and be in the School of Medicine and sort of behind that beautiful Gothic facade, um, there's this very modern looking um, medical campus and I'm sitting right there. Um, and in the, the Duke Aging Center, we're home to a lot of NIA funded centers um, that conduct work um, on resilience and on other aspects of our theme. So the Duke Pepper Center um, and the Prime Collaborative or the Physical Resilience Indicators and Mechanisms in the Elderly are, are particularly developed related to resilience. Um, the theme of the Duke UNC Alzheimer's Disease Center is changes across the lifespan that contribute to the development uh, ex or progression or experience of Alzheimer's disease and resilience certainly comes into play in the work that we do there. And then we also house the Reach Equity Center um, for advancing healthcare equity. And we think about resilience also in that lens as well. Um, so for today, I was going to tell you just sort of the, the Duke Pepper Center framework um, that we've elaborated and then two approaches that we've developed to quantifying the, the degree of resilience um, in, in this framework. 
We focus a lot on provocative tests or stress tests as predictors of real world recovery to real life stressors. Um, and then I'll give two examples of clinical studies that we're conducting um, that that apply the framework. So again, because I'm a clinician, the, the framework that we use for resilience is very much based in sort of clinical um, reality and, and clinical utility. And so I'm going to start with a patient case. And in this case, the patient is my father. So that is my dad there. Um, he's now 77 years old. Um, in this picture, he was it was just pre COVID. Um, so he was about 74, 75, um, and those were my two sons. And my dad relocated um, after retirement um, along with my mom, and, and they both live nearby. And we have, have kidded him that he had changed it. He turned in his title of CEO for the title of MVG, or Most Valuable Grandparent. And that's because he's a, he's a robust man in his 70s. Um, and spends a lot of time with my two boys. So um, not just uh, they, the things that they enjoy doing together are fishing and horseback riding, but he also shuttles them around a lot um, to various sporting events and performances and things like that. So the, the clinical story that I'm gonna tell you is that one time, just right before COVID happened, all three of them, because they spend so much time together, all got the same GI virus. And we've all sort of known the, the um, frustration of a GI virus that you feel terrible for about 12 hours and then the symptoms disappear. And that's exactly what they all went through. But about 36 to 48 hours after the symptoms had disappeared, um, the boys were right back at it. And I went to meet my dad who had taken the boys to um, a baseball game where one of them was playing in the baseball game. And I went up and sat next to my dad in the stands after work and he looked sort of peaked. And I said to him, um, you know, how are you feeling? You, you look like <laughs> you're looking a little pale. And, and he said, yeah, he said, you know, I'm over the GI virus, but he said, you know, watching Chris out there run around those bases, like nothing ever happened. And knowing that we were both sick as dogs just a day ago, he said, you know, it just makes me realize I don't bounce back like I used to. And it's really that that sort of that clinical reality, which is that what we see is people experience some kind of a stressor and it could be in this case a GI virus, it could be something else like a surgery or a hospitalization or a heart attack and oftentimes they will recover, but it seems that they're that people recover in a different pattern. So some people it takes a little bit longer, some people may not recover as fully. Um, and and some people don't get knocked down as far um, and 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 then also have a slower climb back. So so it comes from this very clinical place of thinking about um, how different recovery from the same stressor can be for different people. And in particular, for us as as an aging center, how predictably that changes with age. We saw this obviously play out um, in the COVID pandemic both the fact that the hardest hit population were those um, who were uh, uh, over age 80. And yet, even within that age group, we saw incredible heterogeneity. And, and this is a, a person quoted saying, you know, we had a 96 year old guy who never even had a symptom recovered like nothing ever happened. So what is it? What is it that drives? And, and for us, we're mostly interested in what is it that drives um, at a physical, molecular, or cellular level, what is it that drives that difference um, in recovery when a, when a body is stressed? So considering two patients that are being evaluated for, say, an elective surgery, like a total knee replacement, we might think about two different pa patients that are coming in and are essentially the same chronological age. So a 76-year-old woman who's a caregiver for her husband, she has obesity, hypertension, depression. She leads a pretty sedentary lifestyle. She's had a history of coronary artery disease and is preparing to undergo this surgery. And the same day, you might evaluate a person who's 75. This person has well-controlled hypertension and glaucoma, and that's their only diagnosis. They play golf and tennis and have a supportive wife and two daughters. So we could imagine if we were going to try to predict which of these two patients is going to follow which trajectory, B or C, after the surgery, most of us would probably predict that the gentleman, 
is going to follow a trajectory like B. Almost everybody who has a, an elective knee replacement obviously has a period of time when they're less mobile, unable to do as much for themselves as they recover. But we would expect that he would recover back to baseline, if not even better than his baseline um, when he had the knee problem. And then every so often we see a patient who undergoes an elective surgery and just never gets better. And from that point on, the family will always refer to mom was never the same after that knee replacement or mom was never the same um, after the stroke or the um, hip fracture. And and so much depends in aging on how we bounce back and if we bounce back. And most of the time we could get it right if we took two patients like this that had such different sort of baseline reserve going into the stressor. But sometimes we don't. Sometimes we would get it wrong. And in fact, the woman would sail right through the surgery. And this gentleman who appeared to be a great surgical candidate has complication after complication and never quite recovers. So again, our whole model is kind of based around trying to understand what are the things that we could measure that could help us start to tease apart to predict what it is that causes one person to have a good recovery or, or a not so good recovery. And then ultimately, where can we intervene? What are the opportunities to be able to intervene and, and produce better outcomes for more, more patients? And we really break it down like this. We think about what, what the person's reserve is before the stressor. We think of this as a very modifiable um, condition, not a fixed trait, but a, but a modifiable um, variable of reserve, and we think about reserve could happen in different domains. Examples of domains shown here could be their cognitive domain, psychological domain, physical domain, and we certainly realize that even putting these into different domains is arbitrary because they're all linked, right? We, we, we fully believe as geriatricians that people's cognitive health, psychological health, physical health, other aspects of health and well-being um, are all very much linked, but we, but importantly, we think of this sort of pre-stress reserve as something on a spectrum that changes. Then the stressor happens, and certainly the magnitude of the stressor determines how much the person's response is going to be good or bad. And then we we focus on this sort of dynamic response, a thing that happens at the time of a stressor. And that and that we we watch um, a dynamic process play out of resilience and ultimately what we think is that when that dynamic process goes well favorably, meaning the the downturn is minimal, the upturn is complete and rapid, um, that we would think that that should then predict better long term outcomes like survival, living independently, quality of life. This is the model, and all of this happens within the, the context and environment um, in which the, the stressor happens and the person lives. So the reason that we focus so much on this as kind of a dynamic thing of resilience after the stressor is that we also really think of resilience as this sort of um, ability of a biological system to maintain an equilibrium or to regain an equilibrium after it has been perturbed from its equilibrium by some sort of a stressor. And we think of human health as this kind of constant balancing act where, where um, we are seeking an equilibrium or a homeostasis um, and that there are constant mechanisms in place um, to, to find that equilibrium despite these constant external um, stressors and perturbations, challenges um, that knock us away from an equilibrium. So we think of every person as this sort of complex dynamic system that is that is a, a um, integrated and overlapping set of subsystems that are sort of constantly in motion, moving, transitioning, adapting to changes in an environment, and that that essentially our ability to live depends on our ability to respond robustly and briskly um, to those changing environments and stressors. And we can think of the person's subsystems as their various organ systems, but underneath that, there are these cellular network systems, molecular systems, all the way down to, to um, genes and, and the, the activation and, and deactivation um, of genes. And then that person lives within another complex dynamic system, which is their social networks. So, so this is all sort of part of this framework of how we think about resilience. As I said, 
We recognize that with age, it is fairly predictable that our ability to respond after a stressor declines, but the rate of decline is not the same for everyone. And we're very interested in this question of why. I always show these photos because these are two gentlemen that are the same age, they're both 75. But again, you can certainly see that despite the same chronological amount of time on this earth, they appear very different in terms of what we would call their pre-stressor reserve. Um, so that you could imagine that if they experience the same stressor, the gentleman on, on the uh, left would likely do better because we think of a person's resilience after the stressor being constrained by, not 100% determined by, but constrained by what the, the reserve is before the stressor. And we think of this sort of vicious cycle where if we think of a person's resilience as that capacity, what's gonna happen after they're stressed, we know that the accumulation of diseases over time um, diminishes uh, their, their uh, resilience to be able to withstand the next disease or the next stressor. And then lower resilience makes them more vulnerable to that next disease or stressor. So we see this as kind of a vicious cycle between the accumulation of disease and comorbidity chipping away at resilience and then making a person at, at higher risk for more morbidity. And then another thing that we think a lot about is the geroscience hypothesis. Um, and I wonder this may be something that has been discussed previously in this group, but, but really the idea of the geroscience hypothesis is that um, aging itself, um, the aging phenomenon is something that is, is mediated by these changes at a molecular and a cellular level, and that there are a few biological processes, and I've, I've listed them here, that these biological processes change over time, and that more favorable biology in these, in these what, are, what have been termed the pillars of aging, um, essentially determine the biological age of a person, which may be very different from their chronological age, and we believe that it, it determines or underlies a lot of, of their resilient capacity um, as well. So in sum, kind of what do we see as the influencers of recovery trajectories after a health stressor? Um, you know, I think that we fully acknowledge that, as I said, the magnitude of the stressor, no matter how robust a person is, there are some stressors that, that they would succumb to. Um, we know that a person's attitude and mindset have a lot to do with how they respond um, to a health stressor. Their health status before the stressor, so that issue of their sort of reserve before the stressor, the support systems that are around them, the care and interventions that, that we as a healthcare team provide, we hope have something to do with how, how their recovery trajectory goes. And then that biological response or what's at sort of the, the molecular cellular level um, that is is allowing them to respond. So one of the things that we think about a lot um, is whether this biological mechanism that underlie recovery after a health stressor, whether it's possible that that there are different biological mechanisms that are most important to how vulnerable a person is before they're stressed, and perhaps different biological mechanisms that play a bigger role in the, the in the response to the stressor. So for this, we sometimes use this metaphor of a castle under siege. So I'll, I'll tell you the way we think about it is that if, you, if, if the body is a castle, we might look at this castle before it's attacked and we have some inclination that the castle may not hold up very well to attack. So you can see that there is some frailty in its, in its structure. Structurally speaking, its, its walls look a little um, old and, and damaged. Some of it has been replaced from rock to wood, um, and we think that might not hold up as well against an attack. And so we might predict from what we can see in a static way before it's attacked, that this castle would not be very resilient. And we might be right, but there could be mechanisms that come into play and can be measured only when the castle is attacked that might give it resilience that we that we couldn't know when we just observed it in a static sense. So for example, if this castle has an amazingly trained troop of archers that can pop up into the windows and start shooting arrows, 
that might be like an incredible immune system that can come into play at the time of exposure to an infectious agent or a microbe um, and, and win the day. Likewise, if this castle has incredible stores inside of resources like food and lamp oil that could help it outlast a siege, that might be like having incredible nutritional stores or incredible abilities to be able to manage energy and uh, utilization and metabolism. And a person who has that might be able to survive and get through and recover from a health stressor better than someone who didn't, even if they looked before like they had sort of the same level of structural frailty. So again, we sort of think of, of the pre-stress reserve as like the spectrum between how robust to frail the person is in this kind of static sense that could be measured before the stressor. We think of resilience as really being driven by these kind of dynamic processes that, that are important at the time of a stressor. Um, and and we've, we've tried to set up studies to be able to, to examine and, and um, measure both of these things. So let me get into, um, first of all, how we try to quantify did this person have a resilient response after the health stressor or did they not? So we've, in thinking about this, we first thought about our two kind of key clinical questions when we're thinking about a person who say is facing an elective surgery or has just had a hip fracture. So first we might ask ourselves, well, what's just the pattern of recovery that they would have? If I measured their, their mobility status or other sort of measure of health or function multiple times, what would the trajectory look like if I drew it? Another one is we often think, how much better or worse do we think this person is going to do than expected just based on what I kind of know about them, maybe their age and their, their chronic conditions um, and their functional status before they're stressed? So the first way is, is really just what we call the recovery phenotype approach. And essentially we're trying to phenotype the recovery pattern. So we take some sort of a measure of health and we measure it before the stressor and then as many times after the stressor as we can. So, and, and on a time scale that makes sense for that measure of health. So for example, if the, if the stressor was a hip fracture, we might be interested in somebody's mobility and we would draw it out. Likewise, we might be interested in something else like their cognition. So we would measure their cognition at multiple time points, or we might be interested in their uh, depression or symptomatology um, and would measure that at multiple time points. This is very descriptive. We can do it with multiple different parameters and then try to summarize these multiple outcomes through something like doing a factor analysis or a principal components analysis um, after doing a latent class trajectory um, analysis so that we can group people as um, you know, a class that represents a great recovery versus a poor recovery. And the, the, the downside of doing it this way, the upside is that it's very practical and, and um, uh, accessible, I think. The, the downside is that it is very driven by those pre-stressor variables such as their age and their comorbidities. And this is one study where we did this in the secondary data analysis of people who had undergone a hip fracture. And what you can see here is that we looked at a lot of different measures of health measured at multiple time points after the hip fracture. We looked at their number of step counts a day measured by actigraphy. We looked at things like gait speed, their self-reported function, their grip strength. And, and what was interesting about this was that no matter which of these kinds of measures we use, the latent class trajectory analysis sort of grouped people about the same. We had really good responders, medium, and not so good. <laughs> Um, and and it, the the um, models found those same three groups, no matter which measure of health um, we looked at. But then when we sort of put put it all together into one summative measure, what we found and we asked, you know, what predicts whether people are going to be in that high resilience group versus the low or the medium resilience, by far the most informative thing was their pre-stressor function. And that was really, perhaps not that surprising. So the next way that we tried to think about it was, well, okay, what if we tried to use all of those things that we know about their pre-stressor function? We predict for every person 
um, how they're going to recover based on those things that we knew about them at baseline. And then, so we essentially make a predictive model based off of a cohort of people who have all experienced the stressor. We, for each person, use our predictive model to calculate what we predict their outcome would be at 12 months. And then we look at what their outcome actually was at 12 months or another time point. And the, the differential between what their outcome actually was and what we predicted it was based on factors that we knew about them beforehand. And again, this is in the context of sort of one cohort or one group of people. That difference, what we hypothesized, is that that might actually give us more information about those biological or um, uh, sort of cellular, molecular mediated um, things that cause a person to respond much better or much worse than we would have expected just based on pre-stressor status. So we did a proof of concept to see if that was in, in fact the truth. We picked three of those pillars of aging, so biological um, pillars, biological processes that we hypothesized would be the ones that would especially come into play when the castle is attacked. So the ability to mobilize energy stores, the ability to regulate inflammation and have an adaptive immune response, and the ability to repair your DNA or to activate and uh, uh, necessary genes at the time of a stressor. We looked at markers of each of these sort of um, biological pillars of aging, and we asked the question, does it predict resilience as defined by this expected recovery differential? And in a fracture cohort, we actually found that our biomarker panel explained 38% of the resilience variance. Now to the people who do biomarker studies, this seemed like a huge amount. They were so excited. They're not used to the, a, a, a biomarker, an assay-based biomarker, predicting that much of a clinical outcome. Even in this kind of parsimonious, reduced set of biomarkers that we, we got from lasso regression, it still explained 27% of the variance. So in some ways, we felt that this did, in fact, fit with our hypothesis and, in fact, generated new hypotheses about which biomarkers seem to be the most informative. And at the, at the end of the day, it seemed like the ones that were the most predictive of high resilience, which here I'm defining as the person recovering better than you would have predicted. Those people tended to have lower markers of cellular senescence, lower markers of chronic inflammation overall, higher markers of better mitochondrial function, and higher mark markers that suggested that they had better skeletal muscle metabolism. So again, it, it sort of fit with, with what we would have predicted. So, so that's a lot of how we've been trying to sort of measure, did were people resilient or not? Then we've also turned attention to how we might be able to predict resilience, and, and we focused a lot on provocative tests. So what do I mean by provocative tests? What I mean is stress tests, essentially, so where you measure the response to an experimental stressor and you see if this might actually predict their capacity for resilience for real world stressors in the future. So some of the common ones that are used all the time in clinical practice are like a cardiac stress test, the glucose tolerance test where you give somebody um, a measured amount of glucose and, and it predicts how they would respond to, you know, a, a real world meal. Um, and, and if they have diabetes, um, and then dual task tests. So what do I mean by dual task tests? So I love these tests. Um, they kind of are based on this um, premise that if it, all of us, when we multitask, we tend to sort of screw up both jobs. And in this case, we give people two very easy tasks to do. We look at their performance when they're just doing the task by itself, and then we make them do those two things at the same time. So it's kind of like a test that might be asking, can you walk and chew gum at the same time? In, in this case, we're having them walk and then we have them do a cognitive test. And the cognitive test um, is, is often um, uh, based on a response, response time to getting questions um, answered accurately. When we make people do these two things together, we expect that most people do a little bit worse on each task but the people who do a lot worse, doing a lot worse 
tends to, to predict worse outcomes. So what I'm showing you here is data from a pilot study that I did with dual tasking, where I took people who did not have Alzheimer's disease, were cognitively normal, had no subjective symptoms, but these were people in their 60s, and they had agreed to be genetically tested for Alzheimer's disease risk genes and to not know the results. So some of them, we, we picked a cohort that had 14 people that carried an APOE4 gene or the highest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Then we had 18, we had 14 age matched controls that seemed exactly the same as those other people, but didn't have an APOE4 gene. And what we saw was that when in, in, the, in the single tasks, both groups performed the same way. But when we put them in the stress condition of the dual task, that's where we saw a difference between the groups. And the people who are APOE4 carriers or the high risk group showed greater decline in their walking speed when they were forced to walk and, and do cognitive tests at the same time. So the idea here is that by increasing the sort of demand on their brain, you are evoking a phenotype that potentially um, suggests their risk of Alzheimer's or even early Alzheimer's that they could be harboring um, that is that is preclinical. We also do sometimes ex vivo um, provocative tests. The idea here is that with a provocative test in a very frail older person, there's a little bit of danger in just doing the test. You could potentially be trying to provoke them in an experimental way and actually do them harm. So we don't like to actually expose people to things like toxins, um, but what we do in this case is we expose their blood instead. So we draw the blood, we draw the blood into a tube that, it, that contains the toxin. So we've done it with, um, uh, it can contain a flu virus or a, or a flu vaccine, or it can, can contain the LPS toxin. And then we, we look at how the blood, the, the white blood cells or the peripheral blood mononuclear cells, how they react to that toxin. And we look at whether those that, that mount a greater response um, uh, potentially predict how these people will respond to real world stressors. And it's a way to stress the person um, without putting them in any danger. And then, um, these are a couple of, of um, examples of studies where we're trying to sort of predict physical resilience after health stressors. So the, the first one that I'll tell you about, um, and I'll tell you also this will, I'm expecting that we're going to have about uh, 15 minutes um, at, the, at the end, and I would love to get um, your questions and thoughts. Um, so the first study is um, a pilot study that we called the PRIME EEG study. The idea here was that we did a 32 channel um, EEG um, on 50 individuals that were 60 years or older and were facing an elective surgery. And it, we took all different kinds of surgery, except none of them could be neurosurgeries or cardiac surgeries. So they, most of them were abdominal surgeries. Some of them were um, thyroid or parathyroid surgeries. And we also took orthopedic surgeries. So before the surgery, we, we took them in a resting state with eyes closed and then eyes open, and we got um, an EEG of their brain activity. And then throughout the surgery, they also wore the EEG cap, and we selected three minutes um, per protocol, and then we compared um, the EEG patterns when they were at rest before the surgery, and then during the surgery, which in this case, we were using the surgery almost as our, as our experimental stressor, to sort of then see if we could predict from what their, their brain waves did during that stressor, how they would recover um, in the days after surgery. And then we analyzed the data um, from the frontal leads, and we were interested in sort of how the complexity of the EEG pattern changed. And we measured the complexity by this thing called multi-scale entropy, where you essentially calculate something called entropy, which gives you a sense of the randomness um, within uh, the data, and we calculated it at different time scales, meaning first we used the very coarsest time scale that we could get, which was 200 milliseconds. So, so we sampled the data every 200 milliseconds and calculated the entropy based on that sampling. Then we did a sample that took every other measurement. So rather than every 200 milliseconds, you're looking every 400. And you, you, you go at these increasingly sort of coarse time scales. Um, and, and what you can do is plot these sort of plots that plot 
at the different scales that we calculated the entropy, what was the entropy? The interesting thing that we found was that overall the complexity got higher during the surgery, um, during the time that the brain was being exposed to anesthesia. And then, but what we observed was this very unexpected thing of what we called the crossover point, which means that the preoperative complexity was actually higher when we calculated the entropy at the shortest time scales, but the opposite was true when we calculated it at longer time scales. And, and most, most of the time, um, the, the complexity was higher during the surgery. So this single clear crossover point was present in 42 out of 50 people. Um, in other people, the lines crossed uh, multiple times um, or in a, in a few cases didn't cross at all. And what we thought was interesting about the crossover point was that it seemed to be normally distributed um, and consistent within a person. So within a person, it didn't matter where we sampled the EEG data from within the surgery. We always sort of got that person got the same crossover point calculated. But, the, but it was a normally distributed thing amongst the people who had it, which made us think that it may be something biologically meaningful. And in fact, what we found was that with borderline significance in this small pilot study, it did in fact pre predict um, their change in delirium scores and change in attention scores um, on the day after. So the hypothesis that sort of came out of this was that perhaps the location of where that crossover happens um, may be a reflection of the integrity of sort of neural control mechanisms in the brain. It essentially, the scale at which you see equal complexity intraoperatively and before may correlate to how well, how, how, um, how much integrity um, the, the brain had and how, how well it withstood um, the stressor of anesthesia, basically. So there's a lot of ongoing work. Um, this is the team here. It's led by a team um, both at Duke and then our collaborator, Lou Lipsitz, is at Harvard. Um, the question is, are, are there other EEG-derived metrics besides entropy that may predict um, delirium? Other groups around the country are asking that same question. We're really trying to understand what does that crossover phenomenon mean? What does it represent physiologically? Um, and then is there a way to, to collect perioperative EEG data that may be clinically informative, but is easier, can be more feasibly cleaned and simplified? So finally, I'll tell you too about the prime knee study, which is an ongoing study. We don't have results yet, but it's enrolling 250 people who are scheduled for elective knee replacement surgery. And we collect a lot of data on these people. Um, we are currently at, at uh, about 110 um, people enrolled. We've had a little disruption due to the Omicron um, variant, but we're back up and running now. Um, but at baseline, we collect information about um, folks' cognitive reserve, physical reserve, psychosocial reserve, and then also we do a series of provocative tests. We collect blood for biomarkers, and um, then we uh, monitor people's step counts throughout. And then we collect over time at, at these monthly phone calls and, and quite a bit of data right around the week of surgery, because what we want to do is to be able to sort of draw those recovery um, phenotypes and trajectories. Um, and then one of our main questions is which biomarkers and which provocative tests are best uh, going to indicate um, the resilience after the surgery. These are some of the, the measures that we use to try to assess their pre-stress reserve. So we have, again, physical reserve, cognitive reserve, and psychosocial reserve that we try to sort of measure statically before they're stressed. I'll notice that one of the, uh, I'll note that one of the ones that we use for psychosocial reserve is the resilience scale. It's a 25 item scale um, that sort of, it, captures um, the, the construct of resilience that has been well developed for a long time um, in psychological or psychosocial literature about how we sort of cope at a psychological level to stressful events. And we think that that's incredibly important to how people will respond physically to a health stressor. Then we do the provocative tests. So we do a dual task test. We look at their cerebrovascular reactivity in response to a few stressors. That's what you see here. I, I have this person hooked up to um, an FNIRS or a functional near infrared spectroscopy, uh, which is kind of a poor man's um, fMRI to look at what uh, blood flow is doing in the, the frontal lobes. 
Uh, we do EKG and heart rate variability, and then we do those uh, white blood cell tests where we stress the white blood cells after they're already out of the person's body. I'm going to conclude with, um, this is a participant because I always like to bring it back um, to the patients. This was a gentleman who finished our study and uh, was obviously sort of a poster child for good resilience because we actually had a hard time getting in touch with him to schedule his six month visit because he was always on the golf course. Um, so I had to ask him about. So as you know, one of the things in the study that that we're trying to understand is why some people do really well after surgery like you did. Some people don't do as well and bounce back as well. I wonder what your thoughts are about what what do you think are some of the things that help a person be resilient after they have a surgery or an infection or any other kind of stressor? Well, well, my situation was since it was my, a knee replacement, uh, I felt that my biggest thing was just pain endurance, <laughs> endurance that pain. And uh, once, uh, well, uh, well, actually, uh, within the uh, first week, you know, well, uh, myself, um, I like to say to myself, I'm gonna always go to extreme when I'm trying to do something like rehab and physical activity. So, uh, so uh, within the first week, you know, I was up uh, uh, walking, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at first I had a little walker. And then um, uh, next couple of days, I threw the walk away and just limping around. And so, so again, I think, you know, what I what I hear and what he's telling us is that he's he's placing a lot of importance on his own personal grit and motivation um, and and desire to get better. And, and I think that obviously as much as you know, as a as a sort of biologist, I like to sort of think about the molecular, the cellular um, mechanisms that that probably also helped him get better. I think um, he's absolutely right that his his own personal um, grit and fortitude had a lot to do with it. At another point in the interview, he also credited his wife, um, sort of saying that she. Um, was a little bit of a taskmaster, sort of a drill sergeant about um, his physical therapy. So I think, again, the, the importance of um, social support um, can't be underestimated. And I'll just end with this. I, you know, I always feel like just that there's something about resilience or recovery from a stressor that feels so poetic. And so um, the, the, you know, it's quintessential to the, um, human story and the, and the human narrative. And yet I feel like that by trying to study it, we necessarily have to kind of break it down. I was introduced um, to this artist by um, Steve Krzyzewski at, at Wake Forest, who who likes to show this too. Um, and Ursus Werley is a sort of comedian and artist who says that he tidies up um, great works of art. And here's his take on um, Kandinsky. So I, I am very aware, I think, as a, as a scientist of how it sometimes feels like we're deconstructing something um, that, that is, is, uh, should maybe not be, <laughs> should be appreciated in its, in its full and human form. But I also think that there's um, some, some necessity and also some beauty um, in trying to, to come up with these constructs and concepts um, to be able to advance the field. Um, I just wanna, again, thank the collaborators who make this resilience work possible. There are many, many at Duke and also our collaborators at University of Maryland, um, Connecticut and Jack's Labs, our Harvard collaborators um, and close collaborators at Johns Hopkins who similarly uh, focus a lot on both frailty and resilience. Um, and then our collaborators at the NIA, um, Giovanna Zappala, Basil Eldada, and Chanda Dutta who have really um, stimulated this field um, and helped to um, elaborate and been really strong partners um, in, in how to think about and apply resilience. So I will go ahead and stop. That little creature there is a tardigrade. It's uh, supposed to be the most resilient uh, creature known on the planet. Uh, it's a microscopic creature that you can freeze it, starve it, dehydrate it, um, and it will bounce back. <laughs> so that's our, that's our mascot. Thank you, Dr. Whitson. What a wonderful 
presentation, so full of so much information. I really appreciate you joining us today. I'm going to start with one question, and I haven't been checking the chat box because I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, but so I don't know what that says about my resilience. But I do have one question, but then I will call uh, Dr. Barbara Cohen to help us to sort through the questions in the chat box and um, guide us through from there. Uh, my one question, since we are since the resilience program at NIH is led by the Office of Dietary Supplements, uh, we can't go without asking the question of how might an intervention like a dietary supplement either enhance resilience or go back to that reserve. So you talked a lot about the reserve uh, point being the predictor as to whether or not you would have a resilient outcome. Is there any possibility or any of your studies that have shown that an intervention such as a dietary supplement might be able to boost that reserve in some way? Yeah, so so I'll I'll um, note here two of the um, dietitians who who do a lot of this research and are very involved in the program. Um, Connie Bales and Katie Starr um, are two dietitians that that ask this question a lot, and um, I I don't know that we found what I would say like the magic bullet, <laughs> um, but certainly a lot of their work has suggested that in general, um, for example, if you take particular stressors like heart failure, they've looked at heart failure populations and a lot of the response to a new diagnosis of heart failure in terms of how it affects people functionally can be predicted by that sort of nutritional reserve um, measured in a few different ways. And so I think that that is, a, is an incredibly hot area. And a lot of those pillars of bio, you know, pillars of aging, the, the biological processes very directly relate to um, diet and nutrition opportunities. So certainly metabolism is one of them and energy, you know, energy utilization. But then also when we think about things like oxidative stress and how we might reduce oxidative stress that would have a favorable effect in at least one of those pillars, if not, if not others in terms of um, DNA damage and, and other things. So I think, I think that's a, that's an absolutely um, critical um, area for the future. Great. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, would you mind? Um, green, but yes. So I think just sticking with the idea of um, intervention, somebody asked, did you have a chance to try whether you can improve the post-operative EEG response with some intervention pre or peri during the, during the procedure, such as music, meditation, or something along those lines? That's a really interesting question. Um, we did not, in that particular study, do any kind of intervention. It was that, that pilot study was just observational. One of the things that we did try to look at was whether the choice of anesthetic agent um, might have, a, a, you know, um, play a different role. And among the anesthet anesthetic agents that we included in the study, it wasn't obvious in that small pilot study that one was um, associated with a better crossover point than others. But I think that that's a question that's really worth considering too. And, and that question about, um, we do have someone that, that studies not music exposure during the, the um, during a surgery, but um, in people who are in the hospital, either from a medical illness or from a surgery, um, there's a, she's testing a, a music intervention um, to, to particularly to try to prevent delirium. Great, thank you. Uh, could you explain more about how you calculate the latent class trajectory and the lasso re regression? So the answer would be, I wish I could explain more. <laughs> um, I'm probably not the best person to try to explain. We have um, a data science and statistics lab, and they um, could spend an entire hour explaining. Um, but um, so I have, I have a, a rudimentary understanding of the statistics that, that support it. The idea, though, is um, for the latent class trajectory analysis, the idea is that each person is sort of assigned a trajectory or, or a slope, and the slope doesn't have to be, um, you know, this, the um, terms could be added to describe the, the, the um, if it's not a linear um, trajectory. But each person gets sort of assigned a trajectory, and then the, the latent class part of it is essentially using um, 
an, an empiric approach to try to sort people into different um, class matches. Mm -hmm. um, so, so grouping different tra trajectories um, together. Lasso, as my understanding is, it, it really is just used to um, find the most informative of the the independent variables or the covariables that are predicting some outcome. Okay, great. You have to have my statisticians back if you want <laughs> much more detail about that. We'll go away from statistics and how do non-individual factors um, contributing to resilience, such as social support, environmental factors, fit into your model of resilience? Yeah, so so that's a great question and an area that we are actively trying to expand because, um, to be honest, we're mostly very clinical, translational, biology focused people. And so we see this as an area that we need more um, expertise and partnership. What we have done is tried to measure um, using sort of off the shelf existing indices um, to measure different constructs, um, but we are we are very open to collaboration um, to help us um, capture that piece um, in a more informative way because um, or, or just a, a um, new ways, um, because I think that it is such a critically important piece. OK, great. Um, are there CNS or other physiological correlates of positive effect or grit, so to speak? Yeah, so grit is is something that I'm really interested in. That would be one of those tools um, that that we've used. Um, but but I don't I don't know. Um, it, that is one of the questions that we're going to be asking. Is what are some in the in the prime knee study, for example? Um, what are some of the physiological measures that we're collecting, both the dual task performances and the other provocative test performances, but also the um, the biomarkers? Which ones seem to relate most strongly to these kind of psycho psychological measures? Um, I think is is an open and really interesting question. And also how those how those psychological measures change because that's something that we're looking at too is right. the the pre stressor status, but we also collect that data again six months after. Great, thank you. Um, what type of cognitive task can be used in conjunction with walking to evaluate decreased speed? Yeah, great question. So there's there's whole review articles on on which cognitive task to choose to go into your dual task. Um, and the the one that we have found that is um, has the largest effect on the gate speed um, that so we like to use it and it's also very portable and feasible for clinics is simply um, uh, sort of uh, uh, speech production. So what we do is we cue people to tell a story and we ask them to talk for about a minute and we give them cues like, for example, tell us about your family's favorite holiday and what your traditions are. And then they walk and while they walk, they talk and tell us that story or the cue might be tell us about a vacation that you took um, or a vacation that you'd like to take and what you'd like to do on the vacation. So we give them something where they could talk for about a minute and then we just let them go. Um, and and we use that one a lot because it has one of the largest dual task effects on um, the gate speed. One of the challenges of it is it's harder to quantify performance on that cognitive task. So another one that we will often use is, um, for example, and I, I wish I had the little video in here that shows somebody doing it, but um, it's sort of like a, uh, if you're familiar with a Stroop test, um, it's kind of like an auditory version of it. So when we do this, we have a person and they're usually walking and they have a headset on. So we're recording what they say in the headset and then we can grade the cognitive test later. But they get these cues and, and first, um, the easy version is you ask people, when I say green, you say go, when I say red, you say stop. And then you switch it on them and you say, now when I say green, I want you to say stop. And when I say red, you say go. So it's kind of the opposite of what we're trained to think. Um, and it gets a kind of um, executive function and processing speed. And, and um, that test can be graded both for accuracy 
um, and speed of, of response when we look at the recordings. There's lots of others. You can have people count backwards by threes from 40. You know, there's lots of other um, tests that have been used. How is uh, ADD or attention deficit disorder accounted for in your dual task stress and me measure? Would one with ADD be slower? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we don't account for it directly, but in a sense, every person serves as their own um, control because we're always comparing how they performed on that task as a single task to how they performed on that task, having to do both things at the same time. So it, it is possible that that we'd see a greater dual task effect in people who have um, ADD. Um, you know, one might might hypothesize, and and there may be somebody out there that has um, data to say exactly that. I actually don't know if dual tasking has been tested in in um, ADD patients or as a as an indicator of ADD. I usually think of that as as something that pediatricians or people that study the earlier end of the lifespan usually um, study more. Although certainly older people with ADD get old, so. I have patients with ADHD too. It's true. Um, do you ever use the six minute walk test, which is widely used in cardiovascular research? Yeah. So in the um in the prime knee study, we modified it to a three minute walk test, partly because for the pre the people are about to have a knee replacement. So a lot of them get into a lot of pain, um, even sometimes by the end of three minutes. And six minutes in our pilot study just proved to be too much. For most of them to do so we modified it to a three minute test but in other protocols that are going on in the aging center we we use the six minute task a lot okay have you found that resilience can be developed or have you assumed that it is mostly genetic and based on healthy lifestyle behaviors can wellness coaching make a difference yeah what a good question and i think um i think in some ways it depends on what kind of resilience we're talking about and maybe that's and it, something I think is great about this group and having this um, special interest group is, you know, I think there are probably some aspects of resilience that are very coachable um, and that we can improve people's resilience. There are probably some aspects of resilience, those things that are maybe more um, molecular or biological, that some of those might be genetic and we're born with them or it's, it's luck of the draw. Others might be... Um, modifiable, but maybe not through through coaching. <laughs> um, but I certainly think that um, I think that a lot of resilience is modifiable. And, and honestly, I think it's it's um, the reason that I'm so interested in it and and want to study it. I think we could prepare people much better. There's a there's a let's see how much time we have. I know we're at the end of time, but there's a there's a metaphor that we often use with patients um, that I borrowed from a guy named Craig Weller, who um, studies resilience and, and is a physical therapist, but um, talks about that he used to tell people when he was training them in a military context, he would he would almost like <laughs> scare them on the first day by telling them that they were going to have to go out in the ocean with nothing but a raft. And he didn't know what could come. It might be sharks, it might be bad weather, it might be any number of things. But the only thing that they could control was the raft and the, the military would spare no expense in helping them build a raft to their specifications and any material that they wanted. And they should think about how easily repairable it was and how sturdy it was. And then he would tell them, OK, relax, you're not actually going to have to do that. But the raft is your body and mind and you are going to go out and face things. And I can't tell you what kind of stressors might come your way, but what you can do is ask yourself every night, what have I done to prepare my raft, meaning my my mind and body? And so to that extent, to the to the degree that I think I find I, I've seen patients find that also very motivating to think it's true. You know, as I get older, stressors are going to happen and I'm going to get diagnoses and have events. And the best thing I can do is just try to make my raft as sturdy and easily repairable as possible. Thank you, Dr. Whitson. That's a wonderful way to close a wonderful seminar presentation. I saw lots of thank yous and applause in, in the chat, and so I just wanted to pass that along to you. Uh, 
we're going to close this seminar series uh, uh, with an announcement that the next seminar, I believe, is scheduled for, oops, sorry, I should have had this ready, is scheduled for Wednesday, May 18, 2020, and the presentation title will be Slowing Down Fibrosis in the Aging Heart. Uh, the speaker will be Dr. Mark Entman. And if you want to give your applause by way of your chat or the little emoji to Dr. Whitson, that'd be great. And for now, we're going to close out the Trans and IH Resilience Working Group Seminar Series. Thank you again, Dr. Whitson. Thank you. Thank you so much.